Good evening, everyone. I'm Bernard Schwartz. I'm the director of the 92nd Streetwise Unterberg Poetry Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Marilyn Robinson and Ayanna Mathis. Uh, Marilyn Robinson has made appearances at the Y for, I think, all four of the novels in the Gilead series. And we're very pleased to have her back tonight upon the publication of Jack. Um, she and Ayanna will uh, converse for about 45 minutes, maybe with a, a little bit of reading in and among, and then um, we'll take some audience questions. Uh, you can submit your questions via the chat function below the screen. Um, please do so. And um, before we begin, I just wanted to offer a reminder of some upcoming events. Uh, this coming Thursday, Ayad Akhtar will be in conversation with Oscar Eustace of the Public Theater. And then uh, in coming weeks, we have two rescheduled events. Um, on October 20th, Sadie Smith will be in conversation with Ashley Ford. On October 28th, Sarah Broom will be in conversation with Saidia Hartman. And lastly, I wanted to mention an upcoming literary seminar. Uh, since he's a, a friend of, of ours and of Maryland's, um, Colm Tobin will be back teaching a seminar for us on Henry James' Portrait of a Lady starting November 10th. Uh, that's it for me. Um, here's Marilyn and Ayana, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Hello, hello. Good evening. My head is large as your head. There. <laughs> I, it was my head really large? This is terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope my head isn't too large. Um, I suppose we shouldn't talk, spend the whole hour talking about how large our heads are. It's wonderful to see. Sorry. Oh, I, it's, it, now I'm, I'm aware that my head is rather long. Um, it's wonderful to see you and it's wonderful to be here. And so it's strange. This is the first kind of, of th this kind of event that I've done since COVID. And so it's, it's sort of strange to realize that there are all these people there somewhere um, who are invisible to me. But I'm, um, but I'm glad that they're here too, who are here too and welcome. Um, and this is a wonderful occasion, um, which is that we're going to get to talk about Jack and a lot of other things. And so I'm very excited and I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for wanting, for, for choosing me as your partner in conversation and certainly to the why for choosing me as well. Um, I'm delighted to speak with you. <laughs> um, so I thought that we might start with, um, with I guess what is, is probably a deceptively simple question, which I think, um, you know, obviously m all, everyone who's, who's uh, in the audience tonight um, is certainly a great, is a reader of yours and a, and a great fan of yours. Um, and so we'll know, but I will say this very briefly just in case. Um, and so we'll know that, that, that Jack is the fourth in a, in a series of novels that, um, that are set uh, in or around Gilead, uh, a fictional town in Iowa, and are um, also, and or have this characters who are sort of all related to each other in some way, shape or form. Um, Jack is, is the fourth in that series. Um, and one of the things that I, I guess I wanted to start talking about was that I, I'd been, you know, been sort of reading around reviews and thinking about things. And, um, and I came across one in which you'd mentioned that um, it was early, perhaps after you'd written Home, the second of these, or perhaps even after Gilead, uh, in which Jack Boughton has appeared in, in all of these novels. And uh, someone had asked you about the possibility of further exploring Jack because he's such a fascinating character. And you'd said something to the effect of, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you'd said something to the effect of um, how difficult it might be and what hesitations you had about giving Jack his own novel, um, in part because he's so elusive and complicated. Um, and so I wondered what it was that, um, that sort of led you to override whatever hesitation you might have had and decide to do that at this juncture. And then I also wondered um, if you found that, you, that your, any difficulties you'd anticipated were indeed sort of were difficult as you were actually working on the novel. Um, I uh, felt that I would not know how to make Jack uh, speak, you know, 
or what kind of interior consciousness I could give him. I had a kind of general sense of a sort of interior weather for him, but but not, you know, nothing that I could imagine articulating at that point. Um, but the longer uh, I sort of, the longer I avoided thinking about it, the more it became clear to me that I could indeed find a voice for him. Um, and then when when that happened, I, I, um, I did not find him a div I found I enjoyed writing him actually. But mm. the thing, <clears throat> that one of the things that's sort of crucial, I think, for my coming around to that position is that Jack expects to be seen in a negative way mm. and has a much more sort of um corrosive exterior than than uh, his interior life would actually necessitate or justify. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was thinking as you talked, I so, said, um, this isn't really a question, it's more a comment, but just it would seem that thinking at length about uh, a character, whether you want to write a novel about them or not, is a sure way to end up having to write a novel about them. So there you go. <laughs> true. Very true. There <laughs> so there you go. And what is, I mean, um, I guess that's a, that's a difficult tension or challenge there between sort of this kind of, this corrosive exterior, um, that Jack does have the way he sort of reacted to on the street even, um, you know, for, for those of you who haven't read the novel yet, but have read the others, you'll know that Jack has um, had a stint in prison. He's had some difficult times um, and his physical appearance is kind of, you know, he's got these, these sort of um, well-loved suits. Let's put them that way. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and things like this. And he's, you know he's not he's not completely averse to falling asleep on a park bench and and this kind of thing and it's also very important to mention that this is this is St. Louis in the 40s so you know people's sense of proprieties are quite I I think it's fair to say perhaps firmer in some ways than they are now so his uh, disheveled look is um, it's a bit difficult um, so I wondered I I I guess what you just said brought to mind this idea of that of a of an exterior that is so utterly different than an interior and 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 what happens in the consciousness of a character who is who is burdened with that i mean i suppose to some extent you know none of us can be entirely read from what we look on the outside but jack seems particularly um an impossible to read or would inevitably be read incorrectly because of what he looks like outside yes i, I and you know, um, it, he's very aware of that. He's very aware, of, for example, when he finds himself in, in the cemetery, with with Della, that that whole situation is so liable to being misread, so utterly, you know, by her even, you know, and so he um, he's almost ceremonious toward her, you know, that he's signaling in every way, um, you know, and and in that sense, um, I think he can he's. A, more candid with her, he's less mm. defensive toward her, and more careful about not offending her. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, I was just thinking too. Also, as you were answering that, that there's this, and this is a strange leap to make, but um, predestination comes up a lot in the novel. Um, just sort of repeatedly, and um, you know, there's a whole kind of Methodist Presbyterian <laughs> thing. <laughs> Oh, terrible conflict, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, but but it, you know, jokes aside, predestination comes up quite a lot. And so, and I began to think about the ways in which that manifests itself in this novel, in just just in various ways. And um, but this is a question I was going to ask you a little later because certainly I was going to ask it about the nature of about how that idea influences or affects Jack and Della's relationship um or if it is a there's a sort of metaphorical relationship there um but then also more specifically right now i guess the question that's forming is what does it mean for someone to feel that how they will be received in the world is kind of a foregone conclusion um which i think seems to be 
a commonality, in fact, that Jack and Della have. For those of you who don't know, I'm just Della is a black woman, and, and Jack is Jack is Jack. Um, so, so, what, so, what, what does that mean? And was that something that you thought about in the in the sort of working out of who these people were and who they could be in relationship to one another? Um, yes, I, I, you know, I, I have very complicated views of the whole issue of predestination and, you know, have looked at it in traditional theology and so on. I won't get into that. The question is, I think the essential question is, how do you, how do you interpret the fact that the world consistently is unavailable to you in the sense that it continuously uh, misinterprets you, you know? Um, the, um, oh my goodness, I lost my thread. <laughs> We were talking about the world, sort of what it means if you're you're kind of in a world that is continually going to misinterpret you, almost yeah. inevitably. Exactly, and and in his case, you know, he's not someone who uh, stands apart from uh, from society and criticizes it. He's just someone who feels it profoundly as uncomfortable. He cool. doesn't look for reasonableness in it, you know, and cool. uh, the whole structure of life in that place at that time uh, was is controlling in a hostile and a mindless way uh, yeah. you know what what they feel what choices they would make and, what, and as for the society at large you know I mean the sort of single-minded authority of societies that from a little distance look absolutely mad you know yeah. <laughs> and and people are so so used to being uh, to accommodating themselves to society that they accept its norms as being reasonable when, you know, if mm -hmm. they had a little autonomy in effect, they would, they would know that was not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the things also, I suppose that, that Jack and Della have in common is this, um, is this sense of a sort of, um, um, objection to or discomfort with those kinds of norms. Um, Del is certainly obviously is very much informed by race, but I think it's also informed by just sort of who she is and the, the kind of person she is and the way that she thinks about the world and moves through the world. Um, which brings me to kind of another question. Um, so Jack, Jack and Della, uh, as, as many readers will know, are both uh, preacher's children. Um, now, the, the ways in which they have lived that reality or, or quite different, clearly. Um, but both are born into, into sort of very respectable, large families, um, you know, uh, headed by clergy, etc. very religious upbringings, the whole kind of thing. Um, and it, it was interesting to me, the, the ways in which that both gave them um, a language or at least some sort of basis through which to have some basic understanding of one another, and also the ways in which it, the presumptions about what they might have in common are just completely exploded the more they come to know each other and 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 uh, become more deeply involved in each, with each other. So I guess it was one of the things that my question there, I suppose, is how you envisioned those commonalities bringing them together or at least giving them some sort of common ground and the ways in which they not work against them almost or complicate hmm. their sense of each other. Yes. Um, well, I mean, there are many ways in which Jack, for example, is not welcomed into her family. And one of them is that he's a, a what would you say? I mean, he, I, I don't know if it's even appropriate to say that he's lapsed, you know. Um, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> I don't think he's <laughs> but, but nevertheless, partly because of the poetry that they both, you know, love, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a, a profound poetics in religious thought, and there is a great deal of it reflected in in poetry of virtually any period, perhaps including our own. I don't know, but in any case, uh, whatever Jack thinks, his background has given him the language basically that he thinks in you know mm -hmm. and uh, so even when they're speaking somewhat at cross purposes 
um, they at least know, they understand what the other person is saying. They do share a language, even if they don't share a well, situation or a worldview or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, just as you were saying that, I was thinking about, um, there, there are a lot of things that, about Jack's character that, that that come up repeatedly. And one of them is that he has he's become a man who is so convinced of his own uh, possibility um, or potential is a better word to do harm that he has sort of developed a kind of a almost like a theology of harmlessness or a, attempting harmlessness, mm-hmm. um, and which seems to manifest itself essentially in attempting to kind of remove himself from the world effect- effectively. It was, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about him is that he's, you know, as, he's, as much as he's a ne'er do well. He's really kind of an ascetic, you know. What I mean, he's just sort of like a monk of some sort, you know what I mean? Um, which is very interesting um, and wonderful about him as a character. But anyway, back to this notion of harmlessness. I wondered if you could talk about that because that feels like it has some kind of theological significance in a certain way that that I that I kept trying to figure out and then kept feeling like I was missing. Um, but maybe it doesn't, but. Well, you know, um, I'm very much influenced by the servant songs in Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he alludes to them, you know, the bent reed he will not break. And he mm-hmm. sort of, no one would notice him passing in the street, you know, mm-hmm. this sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. He has no beauty that you would look at him and so on. Um, so in a way, it's, you know, I'm kind of influenced by those Rembrandt paintings where Jesus does look like somebody that you would pass on the street, you know, somebody who would give you a a meaningful look of some kind as he walked through the dark on his way, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, The, the, you know, that side of, I mean, he thinks about Jesus a lot. You can, you know, he really does. He always notices the portraits and all the rest, you know. Um, And, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, imitatio Christi and so on, but in a certain sense, that is a, the nature of his strange pilgrimage. Um, mm. He defines he defines uh, sin as harm, which I think is a pretty thoughtful definition. And <laughs> he, <laughs> he, um, f- he fears because of his the own youth, his own history, that he mm. is not, capable of avoiding harm mm-hmm. and you know and then he falls in love with a woman that he can certainly harm mm-hmm. 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 certainly um i i had to pivot a little bit because i wanted to talk just because it's so striking and remarkable i wanted to talk about the 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 early wonderful scene which i think will just become one of these wonderful scenes in literature sort of known in literature of jack and della in in uh, belfontaine in the cemetery um uh, i won't spoil it for those of you who haven't read the novel but it comes in quite early so it's not too much of a spoiler um and they end up in this they end up in the cemetery and they and they spend the night there um walking and talking and all kinds of things and and i mean it's it's such a striking scene um and it's so odd and it's so unusual um and i wondered you know th- th- you find these it's almost as though they're sort of repositioned as an as an adam and eve almost you know um and um and so i just wondered i just wondered if you might be able to talk about that a little bit um why what you feel or, or what led you in a certain way to decide that such that such an and then usual um, and almost improbable thing would be the appropriate opening for this book, which certainly it is, and what it's what sort of work it does um, to usher us into the rest of the novel or the world of the rest of the novel. Well, I mean, on, on the simplest level, I, I did go a couple of times to St. Louis to look at the city, and Belfontaine is such a you know such an amazing thing, you know. Um, and then, you know, uh, in a way that's often kind of grandiose or hyperbolic, it is that yearning after the lost, you know, that you see in the monuments and the angels and all the rest of it, you know, the, um, the feeling of, uh, you know, 
how do lives mean? Why do they, you know, why are they so transitory? All that sort of thing that you would would see in those circumstances, you know, and um, it's, I mean, it, of course, it's a very most direct invocation of the idea of ultimate things that you can imagine. <laughs> um, all the great issues, basically, you know, are implied. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I wanted them, I don't know, at that point, I wanted them to be able to talk to each other um, Substant. I mean, I don't want. I don't know. The word "seriously" isn't quite the right word. The word "substantively" isn't the right word. But yeah. as as people would do, who were filling empty time, um, mm -hmm. relying on each other's kindness, in effect, and and uh, wondering what the world is about after all, you know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and and stripped in this way, but certainly not made equals, but. Um, but in a certain way, yes, right? Like, like their sort of positions are, are are reversed. Not quite reversed, but I mean, certainly Della, um, who is this incredibly respectable woman, um, the school teacher and, and all of it, um, finds herself in a, a situation, I feel like misinterpretation is going to keep coming up as we talk, you know, finds herself in a situation that can easily um, and very dangerously for her be misinterpreted as something that it entirely is not. Um, and when Jack is sort of doing what you'd expect him to do, he's kind of loitering, you know, <laughs> poetically. You know? <laughs> you know? Um, but nonetheless, so these, these, um, the, this man who is essentially powerless in his daily life becomes a kind of protector um, for this woman at the same time that they both know that that isn't the case. It, it's really quite interesting. It's this series of reversals of reversals kind of thing. It, it's, very, it's very interesting and very lovely and, and strange. Um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about, um, about Jack as a character specifically and some of the facets of his, of his, of his character. And um, he, you know, one of, one of those constant features of his character, I think is this, is a really uncanny ability for him to articulate how he thinks, feels, sees things, um, accompanied by complete powerlessness over those realizations. Like he's sort of incapable to do anything with them, you know, but he knows a lot of things. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and, um, and a company, and, and I think linked with that also is this kind of, this deep loneliness that he has and a deep shame that he has. Um, and those things come up over and over again, not just, I think, with Jack, but but also in in all of your, not beginning for, with housekeeping, you know, this sort of shame and loneliness and um, being ashamed of loneliness, you know, which I think is one of the things that happens in Gilead, you know, that, that the reverend sometimes encounters a shame of the fact of his loneliness, you know. Um, but this is, I guess my question here is, um, is that these things are such a force and such an element. And, and so I, I thought, well, the, why do these elements run so frequently through your work? I mean, they, they're kind of a, they're, they're an engine or a generator of some, time, of some sort. So I wondered how you see the role of shame and the role of loneliness in certainly in this book specifically, but also in the other novels, because it, that, that, that does seem to be a thematic thing that just keeps recurring. Um, I think that they're very, very common experiences that people, again, are ashamed to acknowledge. Yeah. You know? yeah. they're, they're people's best kept secrets, even from themselves. Yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, I may be just confessing here, but I do think that there is a kind of uh, utter vulnerability mm. that people in their absolute core feel about, you know, going out into the world and being this mysterious organism, you know, that that knows more than it can use, basically, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that struggles with emotions that um, do it no good, you know, and so on. Uh, um and this sort of the so people talk about things like self knowledge, but I think that there are layers and layers of self knowledge, and the the inwardmost part is the self protectiveness that's associated mm -hmm. with shame, 
I mean, mm-hmm. that is, and then, uh, and then that fact that we are solitary creatures when it comes down to it, uh, that loneliness is sort of the, the, the atmosphere we live in. And mm-hmm. then there are the questions, can, you know, can it be mitigated here? Can it be soothed there? You know, uh, mm-hmm. so the problem um, for, I think for probably for most people continues to feel like a very acute sort of problem. Mm, indeed. Situated. indeed it, I mean, it, it's interesting because it, um, with regard specifically to loneliness, um, there's, an, there's, a, there's a kind of back and forth in, in all of these characters that I've mentioned in all the novels and then in Jack particularly, um, there's a kind of back and forth between solitude which you know, uh, um, which I think he values very much, and loneliness. That it's you know, so, so sort of is loneliness the price of the ticket for solitude, or something like that. You know that he, and he, um, he doesn't strike me as a man who could ever or would ever want to live in a kind of um, the bustle of constant companionship. That he needs to have himself to himself at times, um, but that he's paying a very great price for it. Um, and that there isn't a great deal of outward appreciation, perhaps, um, for a person like him or a person like Lila, who um, who keeps their own counsel in a way that is both painful and um, necessary to them, and 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 certainly rewarding in some ways. Yes, I agree to all of that. Um, <laughs> Um, Yes, I, you know, um, Jack is a very smart man, a very, and, and he enjoys his mind. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when he, I mean, you know, I mean, he, he he had a family who loved him, who continues to love him, he can assume. Um, But he, um, so he has a memory of that sort of, you know, what it warms or whatever it is, you know, love despite doing very little to answer it with other with love on his own side uh, to all appearances. And that's what he's given up and he has never replaced it with anything, nothing, zero. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so, you know, the the feeling he knows what it might look like not to be lonely, mm. but he cannot he can't re- replicate that experience until he meets Stella, of course, who be who mm. who won't let him, you know, just slip away, starve to mm. death, whatever it is that he's about to do. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and she she is very interesting too because she seems. Um, relatively in as much as it's possible for anyone to be she's relatively free of shame in a certain way you know and it's very interesting in what she what she has as she, as she mentions to him when they're during their evening in the cemetery she mentions um she mentions rage you know and she mentions sort of feeling like these these rages come over her that are almost in, in bod- that she feels bodily and that sometimes she has to go and lay down for a minute so that she can let them pass so she can go back to being a respectable minister's daughter and a good teacher and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I wondered about those kinds of those. Um, there's an interesting juxtaposition there. Like they're, they're, they're able to do something for each other or something um, it, it, because they're in, in this way that because I think because Della is not suffering from a kind of shame. There's, a, there's something about that that allows these two people to come together. But it was, it was just interesting to me because she's so free of it in a way that, in a way that um, other characters, I think, uh, of yours are, are often not. Yes. Um, yes. I think what part of the, you know, there there is this sort of other reality that they both are uh, sensitive to of, you know, poetry, in effect, beautiful language, uh, mm-hmm. beautiful thought, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And in in their separate ways, it is true that this allows them to uh, elude the coercive 
uh, forces of society, whether they are coercing them toward their own good or toward, toward you know, shame. Um, I think, I mean, I, uh, what can I say? It's because there is this other world of the things that can be known and imagined, you know, that mm. help you see the night sky or whatever, you know. Um, they they can walk out of the fallen Eden into <laughs> into the idea of of, yeah, of of another possibility, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I I think that I mean he can take a great deal of pride in it, and so can she. It's her mm. professional competence, among other things. And it's his hin interior life, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking, um, thinking about Jack a bit more, who you know, as we've sort of established, um, has appeared in many of the novels. And I was, um, you first off in Gilead, certainly, and um, and I was thinking about Reverend John Ames in Gilead, and um, and jack sort of comes back to town comes back to gilead and he's kind of hanging around doing various things and um reverend john Ames really struggles with with jack um he struggles to like him he struggles not to just dismiss him he struggles to be kind to him um he says at one point i'll, I'll quote uh gilead quote clearly i must somehow contrive to think graciously about him him being jack also, since he makes a point of seeing right through me, um, and and certainly he does in, in in fact by the end of Gilead achieve a certain amount of grace um, in Jack's uh, regard. But I wondered um, if Jack the, the novel, not, not the character, well both I guess, is also an attempt to kind of think graciously about this man who is very very difficult um, and who does in fact um, do a fair amount of harm. Um, and, and I guess what sort of, um, what process was that for you as his creator, so to speak, um, to, to kind of be gracious in his regard? Um, because that, that novel, the novel, the novel seems enormously an act of grace in Jack's regard. Um, and I wondered if you might talk about that at all. Well, that certainly is what I would have, I would wish to do. I hope I'm gracious to all my characters because I'm a great, I mean, I think that certain, it's like light, you know, certain things only become visible under the light of grace, you know. Mm. Um, I, <clears throat> I, you know, I this uh, question of predestination and so on comes up very often because I bring it up and, and so on, but, uh, <laughs> But um, it, it poses an issues of being lost or saved or all these kinds of things that are part of conventional religious language. I think that if, if to the extent that this, these are useful categories, I don't think that they have anything very uh, closely associated with, with actual day-to-day -day experience or the experience of a lifetime, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that... Um, you know, I'm I'm very struck by the fact that most of the time, most of the world is thinking about something or other, is trying to reconcile themselves to something or find a way beyond something or provide for some care for someone or and yeah. and uh you know if what happens on this planet is basically thought, dreaming, prayers, all the rest of it, you yeah. know. Then uh, aesthetic responses, you know. But then I think that we have to assume that uh, there's a great that this is the great mystery that we don't know what's going on um, within other people, among other people. We can give each other kind of conventional gestures that are supposed to be informative and so on, but basically it's all an inaccessible mystery. And um, I think that that's probably where value lies, actually, and that. It's you mean, in the mystery, you mean, and that sort of the, the things that we can't access in each other exactly. or know. Exactly. I, I assume that that's what is, you know, to a, an outside observer um, in the way that, you know, people can think about that. I mean, it's not a, obviously an adequate uh, idea of God, but to the extent that it's an idea, um, then what would be the object of attention? What would be the object of 
You know, I think, I mean, you know, human being is an infinitely complex creature. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and the world is just humming with the inwardness of these creatures, you know. And and so it seems to me as if inwardness is probably, is, is the crucial thing happening um, and that it does actually move so far beyond anything that we can judge or value. Uh, yeah. That's, you know, that's where I suspect all questions of ultimate worth or ultimate fate mm. uh, are to be found, you know, mm. to be addressed. Mm. So no, I, I made an inward man, really. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think I've done that before. I think I'll probably do it again if I live. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect you will. Yeah, I mean, in that, 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 Going back to that idea of, of grace, which is which always seems to be what 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 Reverend Ames was was trying to say about him, he said, "I must." Uh, when he says, "I must um, somehow contrive to think graciously about him," is perhaps perhaps all of that is um, an attempt to see the inwardness um, clearly enough, or, or at least to acknowledge or recognize the inwardness clearly enough to be um, to be graceful in in conversation with another human being. Um, one of the things I think that's hard is that so there is there is all of this inwardness and these these acts of grace and these things that that that, that are that are very much um, facets and features of, of of being a human being and interacting with other human beings in the world, and then at the same time there 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 is always that the kind of hard tension between that inwardness and the extreme outwardness of mores, proprieties, um, and the extreme expressions of those things like racism and sexism and all of the rest of it. Um, And so I was thinking about what it means for Jack, despite this kind of, or alongside, not despite, alongside the richness of his his inwardness, and, the, and I think the goodness and complexity of his soul, what it means for that man, that always is going to sort of come into this tension with, with the extant realities of the world, right? And so the extant reality of the world is that Jack is a white man and that, and that, and that uh, Della is a black woman and they are in St. Louis in Jim Crow. And so I guess one of the things I've seen about is that what does it mean for him to, for this white man to essentially kind of bring this black woman to a ruination in a context, the American context in which very often, particularly at that time, any kind of close proximity of a white man to a black woman, even if that proximity was born out of love would lead her to some um, to a kind of damnation, if perhaps not interiorly, but certainly with all of the kind of material facets of her life. Um, so I was, I was just sort of thinking a lot about that, about what that means and how how the novel kind of handles it and how it thinks about it um, and how Jack handles it and thinks about it. Yes, um, I, you know, I mean, what happens to Della? What happens to her family? You know, uh, I, I think of her as, you know, somebody that graduated from Spelman, say, you know, a, a private, very well-established black women's college in mm-hmm. Atlanta. Um, I think of her, you know, being the bright, cherished daughter, you know, among all these people that are in a, in a very good position to make the cherishing very palpable and fruitful. Um, and, uh, you know, she would, of course, be part of her father's idea of, you know, do, you know, black people doing their own thinking about what the course of things should be and need to be and so on. Um, and and the sort of uh, ideal family that he's created to epitomize these <laughs> ideals of his and so on. Um, and um, to take her away from that is to take her out of a, you know, a potentially powerful sort of a p- mm. position in life. And also, you know, um, there were so many obstructions in the way of, of black people 
being educated at the time, that the fact that she is educated and that she can teach and so on is mm -hmm. makes her very valuable in, com in the community from that point of view. That ends also, you know, because, uh, you know, I mean, even when I was a child, uh, they were very, very strict about moral behavior on the part of teachers <laughs> when she's actually yeah. violating the law and all the rest of it, you know, she'd yeah. be, she'd be a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. So, um, so whoever she would have taught is injured, you know, and I mean, he, and I think, you know, he, Jack only goes to find her because he's so bewildered. Mm. He, you know, she's the person he, he just needs to see, you know, he goes without any particular plan or hopes or anything um, and finds out that she's pregnant and she, is loyal to him and she will be loyal to him. She's she simply can't uh you know she can't let the conditions of society even the the you know the love of her family she can't say I don't I can't love who I, whom I love. You know what I mean? <laughs> My life has to be curtailed in this way that I will never know the consequences of and so on. Um so she she does something bold, and he does something harmful, harmful, just in the fact <laughs> of being yeah. the cause the better of it. Yeah. Do you think that he? Do you think that he as a character is sort of fully? There's that wonderful scene when he he he's you going repeatedly to to Reverend Hutchinson's church, um, and then at a certain point, Reverend Hutchinson begins to preach at him. And they had very pointed ways, you know, and uh, and and at one point he he preaches at him about what you just precisely what you just said this 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 sort of incredible importance and almost sort of sacred position of a teacher in a, in a black community um, and how to to sort of to do anything to damage that is 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 of is sort of unfathomably terrible um, and so. I was just thinking about that. It's a, it's a great when he preaches at Jack, but in any case, um, he. I, what I wondered, and, and so after he has that 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 sermon, Jack gets up and leaves, and he realizes, oh no, he, he sort of realizes that there's kind of infinite vectors of harm, right? That it's not even just Della, but it's all these young people that she may have taught algebra to, and you know, or or poet. She's an English teacher, I forgot, and now will be deprived of her. And I, so I wondered. Um, and maybe I've answered my own question, but I guess I wondered the extent to which he is aware of the fact that she can only fare worse than he does, and that infinitely more people would fare worse than he does in this arrangement, and sort of what that what that means to him, or what that means sort of in the scheme of 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 doing harm and and all the rest of these sort of writ large themes in the novel. Well, you know, I think in the very first scene when they're talking on the sidewalk after they after he's left her in the restaurant, um, uh, he says, "I I understand our situation. I I can never do you any good. I can do you a great deal of harm. So I'm going to walk away." You know, and and that's you know that's his intention. He acts on it, and mm -hmm. it's uh, I think of Della being in the in the cemetery simply because she's heard so many people, including him, yeah. talk about it is an interesting place, you know. Um, yeah. she, she does not like the constraints on her life that prevent her from seeing what she wants to see and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, you know, it's they are there together, uh, neither of them intending it. Um, and so this sort of uh, volunteer uh, or voluntary exile from her that he imposes on himself yeah. ends not because he has decided that it should end, you know, that uh, under those circumstances, protectiveness means another thing than walking away from her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just checking the time. Okay, we're fine. I have so many more questions and I've, I've, I, they're too long. And so now, okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and some, some other questions that I that I wanted to ask you about. One more in particular that that I think is um, 
that I thought about a lot. There is um at a certain point in the novel, this sort of pivoting subject really, at a certain point in the novel, Jack says, um, how do people live? The oldest question, which of course it is, right? And um and so I, you know, I was thinking about that question in, in all of the ways, you know, I mean, and certainly it's, you know, how do these people manage to love each other? How does anybody manage to love anybody? How do we manage our shame? How do we manage ourselves? All of these kinds of things. And, um, and I was thinking because of this sort of the, the nature of, of this relationship between Jack and Della um, and, it's, and it's moment in history when this happens, um, that it's, it's as though, um, it's as though that question about how do people live takes on, has its metaphysical meaning, um, but also has a very specific kind of historic meaning and a very specific historic context. Um, because certainly in all of your novels, going back to Gilead, there is this question of the sort of the biggest sins and the oldest wounds, you know, and I'm talking about the civil war and I'm talking about slavery and all of those kinds of things, which Gilead spends a good deal of time thinking about. Um, and 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 ruminating on, and then and then you know, sort of American history goes through its paces, and we arrive at Jim Crow, you know, um, <laughs> and, and you know, <laughs> and, and the way in which um, the question of how people live um, is informed historically, as well as it is metaphysically, religiously, spiritually, and all these other ways. So I just wondered if you if you could talk a little bit about about um, about how about that question of how people live it being such an old question and how that is played out in this context and particularly in the American context as you have explored these things in this novel and the others that precede it. Yes, well, yes. I'm oh. Oh. <laughs> What did you say? What? <laughs> How people live that, you know, people, they, they're like nest makers, you know, they, they create the circumstances for their lives around them to the extent that they can, to the extent that they, or, or, or they find themselves actually occupying a terrain that's already been prepared for them in ways that are determining, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, you know, I use, the, Jack is very aware of churches, of course. He walks mm -hmm. by them and he knows all about what's going on inside and all the rest. Um, and, you know, he thinks of them because of who he is as being very central to the question of how you live, you know, and in all their diversity, you know, the way that they ponder the brevity of human life and all the other things that happens. Mm -hmm. in but in any case, um, I think that, Basically, we decide what is salient in our existence and, and conform ourselves to it more than we conform it to ourselves. Um, it's kind of a, you know, uh, St. Louis did an amazing thing. They they destroyed the black neighborhood that what Della would have lived in. Like They destroyed a very, very substantial neighborhood, including 44 churches. And then they then they sort of went away and didn't make up their minds about what they wanted to do with the land that they had in effect emptied, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I mean, this is a you know, from not very much distance, this is a crazy looking thing, you know, the, a, a culture just you know ransacking itself in effect for mm -hmm. no describable reason, you know. I mean, no no reason that it would acknowledge, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And but these th these great assertions that are publicly acted out, that are acted as if they're part of civic life and so on, mm -hmm. they make they inevitably make a huge impact on people's idea of what civil norms are and what is possible, you know, mm -hmm. under this this circumstances of power that can be acted out in that way and so on. Um, and uh, I mean, he sees that and he, he laments, you know, all these churches being destroyed, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, he, he, what do you say, basically? Societies do things that are unbelievably self-destructive. Mm -hmm. I think that if there were any final reckoning made, people would be found to have done themselves much more harm 
than any enemy would have done, people as society, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and so that being a given in a certain sense, and the question is how do, how do people who seem entirely sane and plausible in niche themselves unconsciously, yeah. automatically, in the, so that they become, you know, collaborators in collective behavior that really just mm -hmm. utterly defeats, you know, reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have um, a couple of lovely questions from the, the people who are out there listening um and so i um or we have well actually we have one question so i think we have time i'll make sure I'm, i'll ask this question and then i have one more question of my own that might be able to sort of take us out so this question is could you speak to the figure of the transient the notion of transience in your work jack as a possible transient in the tradition of sylvie from housekeeping and also Lila. I'm I'm most interested in people who don't have, you know, the off that are not described describable, but in terms of status, credentials, uh, physical beauty, property, you know, any of those kinds of things. Uh, that's sort of my essential human being type, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, who who actually is not accessible to the uh, descriptive habits of of societies and people in societies, you know, um, and people who actually have to live their lives out of themselves rather than having uh, the the support of things that define them negatively mm -hmm. or positively, um, or especially positively. Um, I'm not. I, I, it's probably just an eccentricity of mine, but I'm not interested in, um, I'm not interested in anything that is attenuated in terms of the, what it reflects about the humanity of the person I'm trying mm -hmm. to look at, you know? I don't mm -hmm. want secondhand definitions. And mm -hmm. in order to avoid them, I'm pretty tough on my characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I should say here, hopefully not inappropriately, but I was Maryland's student um, at Iowa and I learned most of what I know, I think, um, about how to talk about writing from her. And, and um, one of the things that you said, and this is a sort of very simple way of putting it, much much less eloquent than you, surely you said it in the classroom at the time, but was that one of our sort of greatest duties as writers was to avoid reduction and oversimplification. Um, which seems to be both um, um, certainly a hallmark of good writing, but I think also a hallmark of being a good moral person, right? Like if if, if, the, if we're going about the business of of recreating some semblance of a human being on the page, then we do harm to ourselves, to our readers, and to whatever sort of the ether of ideas, right? When 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 we sort of reduce people into something that is. Um, less than what people are, um, which is a thing um, that I'm, I'm only sort of repeating a thing that you said to us in class, uh, which I have taken with me always, always. Um, I wanted to, I, I, the transience thing made me think of a, a question that I, I thought that I think we might just have a little time for. And it, it had to do with time. Um, and it had to do with the way that time sort of behaves in your novels. Um, and, and, in Jack particularly, but I think also in Housekeeping, also in Gilead, certainly in Lila. And, and there's some link between this notion of time and transience. You know, constantly in Jack, there are these markers of time. And then it was Sunday, and then it was Friday. You know, and then I slept until dawn, or I counted the hours that I couldn't sleep until dawn. Two weeks passed. And these sort of very specific markers of time that almost serve to underscore um, it's arbitrariness and, and this person's sense of being, um, I don't know, lost in time or outside of time or just having a very different relationship to time than other people do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I wondered about that. I, I wondered if, if, if this, if 
how you think about time as it's being experienced by a character like Jack. And if that has anything, and if that has any sort of larger metaphysical implications in the way that you think about time in these novels in general, or the way that people live inside time. Well, I do, I, I think of, of time as not sequential in the way that it's normally thought of. You know, and the time is very mysterious. It, it's very elusive from the point of view of sort of physicists' attempts to mm -hmm. understand it and so on. Um, and I, you know, I I do I take that seriously because if our habits of thinking about time are false, then many other falsehoods attach to them. You know, um, mm -hmm. and they do sort of regiment thought you know, or, or behavior and the idea of their sequentiality, you know, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm, but the, um, mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, you know, Einstein said man's most persisting delusion is time, time mm -hmm. is man's most persisting delusion. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people in a certain sense know that intuitively. Mm. That, that what, what what we're led to understand as being the movement of time and so on doesn't describe the actual, uh, you know, I, I would almost say volatility, you know, mm. uh, and you know that I um I don't know how much my metaphysics feeds over into the problems of my characters pretty considerably, <laughs> I think, <laughs> but. Um, he he acknowledges time. I mean, there's the Sabbath, of course, which you know is deeply ingrained in him. And then there's uh, the you know looking at the world and saying these people come to work on time. Yeah. They, every, day after day, there they are. You know, yeah. as, as if it were a great mechanical clock. You know that that yeah. one, you know, um, and um, the, he doesn't participate in time in the same way they do and therefore he sees how that is and how arbitrary it can appear and and how it behaves like necessity when it can't be necessity and so on mm -hmm. and consequence you know there's that that interesting when they're in the cemetery um you know they're, they're sort of in this adam and eve kind of thing you know they have this conversation of you know well what if there were no rules and what if it was all gone and we had to invent all of it and it's as though in a certain sense they're talking about a world in which time didn't wasn't kind of attached to consequence, right? Because they've sort of removed consequence in this kind of experience, experiment, rather, I'm sorry, that they have. Um, and so there, it, it did, I, I did sort of wonder, um, which is things from thinking about that, about how these two people are attempting to kind of create a, a reality that could exist outside of time or which, or, or that sort of didn't have to take into an account, take it into account and therefore didn't have to take any of the rest of it into account either, you know, like if, <laughs> you know um, which is, which is a, a kind of lovely and strange, but I guess sort of an appropriate thing to do in a cemetery. Um, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, please go ahead. Oh, I was just, I, I was wait. I didn't, Quite hear the question. I think everything. No, I didn't think there was really been true, but I didn't hear the question. Pardon? Pardon? I didn't ask a question, which was very bad of me. Um, but if that made you think of anything that was answer-like, you could you could okay. offer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did not give you a question. I have to rise to this occasion. Answer-like. Let me think. Well, my first thought was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I mean, even that scene is a kind of experiment in time because uh, time pa would pass very differently as, as experience mm. if you were trying to get through a night together with somebody that you are afraid of offending and afraid of not being able to protect and, and at the same time are having a perhaps uniquely satisfying conversation with, you know. Um, and um, I, you know, I mean, insofar as time is is something subjectively apprehended, uh, that that it was either the longest or the shortest night of Jack's life. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed.
Um, it would seem so quickly that we have come to the end of our hour um, and the end of our lovely and wonderful conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you. You were just great. Everything you said resonated with me deeply. I thought, yes, I hope she's right about my book because she makes it sound awfully wonderful. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. Thank you for it. Thank you for this novel. Um, good night. And good night to all of you who have been who have joined us for this evening. Um, thank you. And yes, adieu. Adieu. Thanks again. <laughs> thank you.